Okay, here we are at Think Tech. It's the one o'clock block. It's looking to the east. And we are in touch with Steve Zercher in Kobe, Japan, where he is a professor and dean at the Kansai Gaidai University there. Welcome back to the show, Steve. Nice to see you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, share stories with you, Jay, about uh, what's going on in Japan and contrast that with what's going on in the United States. Yeah, and well, sometimes the operative word would be to compare rather than contrast because Japan <laughs> follows the United States in so many ways. But can you talk about the current situation in terms of the number of uh, coronavirus cases and deaths? Right. And how the government and the community is reacting? Sure. Yeah, I, I agree with your point that uh, politically from World War II, America has followed in the footsteps especially when it comes to foreign policy and other major issues. But at least on COVID, uh, Japan has not followed the United States, which has been a fortunate thing. So like, for example, I just want to show your American viewers, I'm wearing a mask. I'm in my office here by myself, but I'm still wearing a mask. Um, it's funny to see in, uh, in Japan, I'll be driving on the road. People are in their cars by themselves wearing a mask. It's just, it's so fundamentally a part of the Japanese culture that they wear masks even when they're by themselves. It's like my wife, when she's talking on the phone, she's bowing. You know, the person, of course, on the other side of the phone doesn't know that she's bowing, but it's such a part of culture. You know, she'll say, arigatou gozaimasu, thank you so much. So this mask culture is certainly an example of something that's very distinct if you want to compare it to the United States, right? Where masks become a political issue. Well, anyway, it's, a your question. it's a statement, isn't it? I mean, it is. It's, I mean, you really it's, wonder it's why. Remarkable. Yeah, what they're really saying is, look at me. I am community minded. Look at me. I care about you know the people in the community, and and I'm a I'm a good person because I'm wearing a mask. Yeah, there's a a, a subtle, maybe even stronger than subtle, social pressure in this country to adhere to community goals and standards. And masks are a fundamental part of that. Protect, like, for the use of masks before COVID uh, were for two reasons. And it was usually during this time of year, 50% of the people were using masks. The first reason is because of allergies. So they're trying to protect themselves from breathing the pollen. The second, if you're sick, you don't want to infect others. So you wear a mask to protect other people. That always, when I got here as a student, I recognized people are wearing masks, not to protect themselves always, but to protect others. It was mm -hmm. like, wow, this is very different from where I come from, from America. Yeah, but you know, from a medical point of view, that's pretty much so. Um, people think that it's going to protect them, but it's actually protecting everybody else from them. Yes, that's um, right. And, and you wonder um, you know, where, that, where that fits in terms of the Japanese perception. But let's let's talk about you know what's going on in terms of the cases. Yeah, yeah. And the Sorry, deaths. I kind of, yeah, I was I was going into my professorial role there and avoiding the the question from the student and talking about things that I want to talk about. But anyway, <laughs> let me address your question, Jay. So yeah, I just took take a look at the last statistics. Um, so in total, so far, the uh, the uh, Japan is at eighteen thousand four hundred and seventy six infections. Now, just to put that into perspective, the U.S. yesterday had 36,000 infections. So the US yesterday in one day had more, two, twice as many infections as Japan has had this entire period. It's remarkable. The number of deaths too, it's, it's completely off the scale, difference between Japan and the United States. So uh, Japan, even though, as I was mentioning to you before we went on air, uh, there seems to be a little bit of an upward tick in terms of the infections for a long run there, they were in the 20 to 30 range. Now they're going into the 50 and 60 range. This is just in Tokyo alone for the country. It's probably 80 to 100. But uh, overall, Japan is still considered to be a success in terms of how, I wouldn't say the government necessarily, but how the culture, <clears throat> how this mask wearing part of the culture has helped to defeat COVID. If you compare Japan to the other G7 countries, which are all in a uh, much more difficult situation, France and Germany, United States and so forth. Well, when, when you, uh, you've been parallel to us in so many ways, 
Um, so, okay, uh, we, we were hesitant to start doing anything. You were hesitant right. to start doing anything. Correct. Uh, then we got into a kind of national lockdown. You got into a national lockdown. Right. <clears throat> and, and um, you know, everybody was mindful of social distancing. Okay. And then, and then the next step was uh, um, reopening, you know, and I think Trump had a lot to do with that when he got up and said, we're back, we're done, yep. all finished. Right. Uh, which was really an absurd statement because there was no evidence whatsoever to support the fact that we were done and we finished and we had beaten it. We won the war. That's kind of ridiculous. Um, and I right. think that affected the world. Everybody, you know, so many countries took that to heart, even though mm -hmm. there was no evidence to support it. And the, and the word of the day was reopen and Japan reopened. Yep. Okay, so, so the question is, when Japan reopened, did Japan take off the masks, stop doing uh, <clears throat> social distancing? Yeah, it, it was interesting to observe. Um, the mask phenomenon still continues, even with the lifting of the national emergency. So, um, as I mentioned, people in their cars are using masks at a much higher level than before. Uh, when you go on the streets, in the train stations, 99% of the people are wearing masks. So even though the government is not uh, saying that or repeating that as a message, uh, the Japanese society as a, as a whole has incorporated that into a protective measure. So that is continuing. After the national emergency was lifted though, uh, incrementally you could see day by day, the business was increasing. So traffic was getting heavier, the trains were, uh, were more filled, uh, business activity was picking up. So it took about a week or so of kind of incrementally regaining the same kind of economic energy that existed before the national emergency, before COVID actually took place. So um, I, I think, you know, Abe is influenced by the United States, America, uh, Japan is influenced by the United States strategies and policies. But also in, in Japan, just like in the United States, the influence of business on the Japanese government, especially the current party, actually the, the only party that's run Japan since World War II, uh, the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party. I mean, they're funded by the, by the business and so forth. So uh, Abe had to balance the interests of public health against the interests of business. I think in the United States case, Trump really didn't care so much about the public health. He was more interested in the economy returning to a higher level as soon as possible. I don't even know if he was pressured by the businesses to do that. Um, maybe it was just because of his own political concerns. But Abe waited the appropriate period of time. The incidence of, of a COVID infection had remained flat for quite a while. So we followed international standards here in Japan before the national emergency was lifted. And there was complaining from the business community that he was taking too long. But I, I think he actually did, did balance things appropriately. And if the WHO was to take a look at what Japan did, they would give Japan a thumbs up. Whereas if they look at the United States, it's, it's a disaster. Everybody who looks at what's going on in the United States considers it to be a disaster. Well, yeah, just one point. Um, you know, in the United States, um, the, the people who run the big companies, um, you expect that they would lobby anybody who held the reins. They would, they would communicate with Trump and they would say, you've got to open the economy. And I think in, in Hawaii, we had some of that. The hotels, you know, they're, they may not oh, be sure. locally owned, but they do provide jobs. And, and um, you know, the, I think- Rufi Hanneman, was, right? Rufi Hanneman, I'm sure he was part of it to yeah. say, we got That's to reopen now. This is, these are my constituents, the hotels, you've got to reopen. So there was pressure on David right. Ige and various others in government. Um, from, you know, from essentially lobbying groups. But it doesn't work that way in Japan, does it? I mean, they, the big, uh, what do you call it, KK? The big KK wouldn't uh, come around and try to uh, lobby Abe, would they? Um, <clears throat> not as strongly, not as directly, but the LDP is very closely affiliated with business interests, and it always has been from the 1950s. So Abe has to weigh those things out. It, it, I don't think it takes Toyota calling Abe and saying, look, you know, you need to open things up so people buy cars again in, in Japan. But he's conscious that that's his one of the bases of power 
for their management of the government and their control of the government. But I would agree with you, I'm not a political scientist, so this is my own speculation on this, that the influence of business is there, but it's not as explicit. You know, I'm sure Trump gets phone calls from his buddies, you know, like the casino industry, even though he was a failure in, in that, and maybe he's not regarded very highly by the casino companies, but I'm sure there were a few phone calls saying, hey, look, you know, we're, we're losing X amount of money every day because we're shut down. Uh, you know, can you kind of push things along a little bit? I'm sure that that happened. Sure, that wouldn't yeah. happen here, though. Yeah, yeah. So now, you know, so, okay, runs a parallel worth comparing. Um, yeah. So then, the, the you know, Abe opens and uh, then the numbers go up. No surprise. And that's yeah, it's a lag. The world. So, it's a lag so, of about six to seven weeks. But yeah, that's what we're experiencing right now. So does that mean that there's a pause right now? They call it a pause, right? A pause in the reopening? Does it mean he's... He's turning it back a little bit or a lot. No. But what is he doing to deal with the, the problem of, of increased numbers? Uh, right now, it, there's just a, a kind of a cautionary approach. Okay, this is not good that these numbers are now picking up. This is not what we expected. Many people in Japan have concluded that Japan had won. You know, so this is not welcome news. Uh, when the consensus comes to an agreement that, okay, we're Japan, we don't know how we did this exactly, but we defeated COVID. We're better than the other countries that are struggling. Now there's some evidence showing that maybe that's not quite as true as what they had hoped. Um, so there's no comment yet so far. And as I mentioned in Tokyo, where of course the biggest problem is, uh, there's an election next week and the, the governor, the incumbent, who is a heavily heavy favored, not a word. She's quiet on this. She's not saying anything about this. Maybe after the election is over, She'll say, hey, look, if these numbers continue like this, we're going to have to go back and I'll have to encourage people to stay home again. Or these, these businesses where the infections are occurring at a higher rate than we expected, we'll have to close again. That's possible. Right now, we're in kind of a wait and see mode. Yeah. So it's not well, as bad, though, as, as Florida or Texas, you know, where the hospitals are being overwhelmed and, you know, they're serious issues. It's, it's much uh, graphically, we're following the same curve, but in terms of the numbers, it's much, much smaller. We're, we're talking hundreds, not tens of thousands like mm -hmm. the U.S. is facing. So I was telling you about an article that somebody sent me this morning from The Atlantic, which has very thoughtful, very perceptive articles. And uh, this article was entitled something along the lines of, has, has the U.S. given up on COVID? I mean, have we have we decided that we can't do much about it? Right. Uh, and we might as well just lay back and enjoy it. Um, and I mean, it's really sad to think that, to even to have, even to posit it as a, as a proposition. But there is evidence in this country that a lot of people, um, mostly the Trump followers, have, it's been politicized and they have given up. Uh, they, they don't care about social distancing. They don't care about masks. They don't care about community events, and and uh, yeah, right. They don't care. They don't. And I'm not sure exactly what their mindset is. Like part of it is they they follow him. He doesn't wear a mask, and he puts it down, and mm -hmm. he doesn't take this thing very seriously. He never did. Um, so they follow him on that. It's a it's a statement of um, in their view, um, patriotism, uh, the, that warrior like mentality. We're at war and I'm gonna show you how strong I am. I'm gonna ignore yeah. all this liberal talk about how we should care for each other and help people survive through a pandemic. I'll right. take my chances. Which is kind of interesting because the Atlantic, the writer in the Atlantic puts it slightly differently. You guys are you're giving up on something you could be doing. Right. And so this is a very dramatic kind of result, but there are a lot of people in this country, actually both sides of the aisle, who go out in the streets, participate in community events, including demonstrations and counter demonstrations, who talk at each other without masks, who spray um, you know, droplets all over each other with, with virus. It's not a surprise that the mm -hmm. virus sort of mm, multiplies in, in that context. And before you know it, you have a reinfection. This was not a surprise, um, yeah. but it, it is a surprise that so many people are, are so either ignorant or willful about showing how courageous and warrior-like they are. Um, 
anyway, so I'm wondering if that phenomenon exists at any degree at all in Japan. No. Yeah, it just doesn't. Mm -hmm. If Abe was to go out there and say, uh, let's say the, the secondary infection rate continues and increases, if he doesn't do anything, um, he will be harshly criticized, even by the conservative media, because fundamentally, his job is to protect the welfare of the citizens, the Japanese people, uh, you know, that are here. And uh, already his ranking, his uh, rating rates have sunk significantly because the government really hasn't been proactive in the sense that uh, Taiwan was or New Zealand or Korea or, you know, China belatedly. You can compare Japan to other Asian countries that did a much better job in managing this. Japan, fortunately, has been overall successful, but I think there's more cultural reasons for that, or actually there's unknown reasons for that. No one really can say explicitly why Japan's done so well. So if he was to say, oh, well, you know, there's nothing we can do, throw his hands up in the air, and Japanese people die as a result of that, he'd be out. His own party would kick him out. It, it, that is unimaginable in the political context of Japan. You know, again, it gets back to this community sense. His responsibility, just like every other citizen in Japan, is to wear the mask, right? And he wears a mask. He's not like Trump who doesn't wear a mask. He wears a mask because he's also contributing to public security and public health symbolically. And also I mean, he probably believes that's the right thing to do as well. So that kind of fatalistic, you know, kind of libertarian-ish, uh, frankly, irrational thinking that you're talking about and the Atlantic article apparently is addressing, that fortunately doesn't exist in this country. You know, sometimes when I'm talking to my parents, I, 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 I mentioned that I'm living in the civilized country and you're not. <laughs> you know, America sometimes behaves in ways that are just totally inexplicable. But Jay, you know, fundamentally, this, when it comes to politics, uh, you know, I studied economics initially, you know, we, one of the assumptions in order to support all the economic theories is that we're, humans were rational and they'd make the right decision. You know, if, if you don't have that assumption, then of course economic theory just falls apart. <laughs> but the fact is behavioral economics has proven that humans are not rational and they do stupid things that are counterproductive to their own interests all the time. And what you're describing is a perfect example of people behaving in this partisan way define logic, define their own interests. You know, it just proves how irrational we are as a human race. Some are more irrational than others. I mean, there's a, there's a gradation on this. I'm, there's some parts of me, I'm sure, that's irrational. But when it comes to protecting my family's health, or uh, as a, even as a foreigner in Japan, I wear a mask. You know, I, I, I do that because I want to also be a part of a functioning community. So I make mm -hmm. that commitment as well here. You know, this, this is a really a study, and you know, I, we don't have it so starkly presented as now, um, of the way um, human communities make decisions. You know, if you leave it up to the crowd, you know, query whether the crowd, you know, the uninitiated, maybe untrained, maybe um, leaderless crowd, uh, will they ever be able to find consistently good policy? And the answer is, I'm sorry, but probably not. At the end of the day, and especially in a, in a, uh, a, a complex world, a world full of science and technology and environmental degradation and, and, and viral threats like this, you have to have experts. And you have to have experts who will tell people what to do because people want to listen. I mean, even in Japan, they want to listen. They want to, they want to delegate it all to Abe. You take care of it. You don't do a good job. We'll let you know. But you know, yeah. we are we are dis, we are delegating this power to you so that you will do the right thing and we will follow you. Um, and 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 that that you know, to a large extent, it, it works in Japan, but it also works in the, the other Asian countries that you mentioned. Yeah, Singapore would be the example that comes to mind immediately. They're having a bit of a relapse too, um, mm. but. Um, you know, in the U.S., it's libertarianism, it's the independence, it's the exceptionalism, is, um, you know, we'll get through this no matter what, what we do or what I do. 
And yeah. the problem there is that that would work if you have a leader who says, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me give you some straight poop here from incredible right. government agencies. And you believe me and you believe them. And I'm going to tell you what to do. And then you want to do it. Even that is imperfect because a lot of people in this country won't do it anyway. Never. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have a president like we have now, um, it's really out of control. Uh, he's wrong on everything. Um, people aren't going to listen to him on most people. And so you don't have a single voice speaking. Public policy is being made in the street. How exactly can that be right? It's not working. You can look at the results. I mean, you can't argue with uh, the lack of results that the United States has had. It's number one in terms of infections, number ones in terms of deaths. 36,000 infections yesterday, Jay. And I just looked at it before the show started. That's incredible. It, it was below 20. I mean, relative, that's still horrible. But now it's almost doubled. So Well, and the guy from the CDC said, you know, for every case that we know of, there's 10 we don't. Yeah. 10, 10. So it could be a multiple, huge multiple of that, of right. actual infection. So, Jay, uh, this means, I, when am I going to be able to visit the United States? I, I don't know. You know, if I, if I went to the United States today, I could do it, of course, and America would accept me and have to go through quarantine. But you know who would not allow me to come back? Japan. Hmm. Japan wouldn't even allow me to get on the plane. Oh, you could always go to Europe. I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i mean all these doors are coming down between continents between countries and to some extent between states despite mm -hmm. the commerce clause and the constitution and so mm -hmm. what we have is a general shutdown and and um you know again it's a question of leadership again it's a question of nipping in the bud you know stitch in time saves nine Pro right. problem is though and i would like to ask you about this this social social experience that we're having, where people yeah. people do not respect the leader or the leader is not worthy of respect, whatever it is, and there's no single voice telling us what to do. Mm -hmm. um, are we gonna be able to recover from that? How do we recover from that? How do we change yeah. it, change it to a place where um, people are so desperate, okay, that they'll they'll take advice from a credible leader? And there are credible leaders somewhere who emerge. Right now, I don't see that happening. Yeah. Um, the thought that I have there is that I, I look at my business career. And uh, I've worked for startups. So that takes a certain amount of energy when you're starting from scratch to try and address a problem or accomplish a goal, which is what the United States had the opportunity in February, March, April, you know, completely didn't do anything. Then I've also worked for turnarounds. You know, where I go into a situation where the GM had been fired, it's a complete mess, the reputation of the company is horrible. That is so much more difficult to do. That's the worst job that I've had. I had to do that two or three different times to clean things up. It takes a tremendous amount of energy. It takes strong qualities of leadership. So, uh, you know, if we do have a new president, if Biden becomes president, does he have the charisma, the capability, the leadership quality to try and right the ship. Uh, you know, it, without that kind of leadership at that level, um, I don't see how the problem can be solved. And I, I, I frankly, we haven't talked about U.S. politics. I, I don't know if Biden's the right person to do that. Maybe he can designate it to someone else in his cabinet or his staff to be the coronavirus czar, you know, to have someone in a leadership role to try and lead the country out of the mess that it's in right now. But even if that person was the best person possible and had all of these skills and had done this type of thing before, I don't know, Jay, it's, it's, it's tough. It's really hard. Well, you raise a very interesting uh, thought. And that is that um, sometimes you have a, a bad leader and, and the, the public sort of shoves off from that leader. They criticize that leader, won't take advice for good reasons. Um, okay, then that leader is out. The public throws him out, like somebody else. And the, it, to me, I've seen this happen. I won't name names, but I've, I've seen this happen. 
where now there's a better leader, theoretically, a better leader in office. But the public and the media, they're, they're in a culture of criticism. They're in a mm. culture of let's bring that guy down. Let's bring him down. They're, all politicians are bad. We can't trust anyone. And yeah. so the second guy who was pretty good leader and straight shooter and all that, he can't make traction because the community around him is so negative on politicians in general. Mm -hmm. and, and I suspect that, you know, we may see that in the case of Biden. Um, he elected yeah. and, uh, you know, everybody uh, a sigh of relief. But then you get back into that rhythm of, um, well, he didn't do this right. He didn't do that right. And let's get some raw meat news, even though it's small stuff and criticize him for this, that and the other thing. And before you know it, his credibility is, is just as bad as the fellow who preceded him. I worry about that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a that's a a practice, uh, a phenomenon in United States politics. You know, like like with Obama and Ebola virus. You know, in hindsight, that was handled as as well as it possibly could have, and the the results of that were were minimal. You know, at, in the beginning stages of that, there was a, a fear that what's happening now with COVID would happen with Ebola, but. He was very proactive, but at the same time, Jay, to your point, he was constantly criticized by the Republican Party, by Trump even, saying, you know, it's a disaster. So that's a, that unfortunately is a, a phenomenon of American politics that even a good leader will have to face. Um, yeah, I, I, there's no way around that because if Biden becomes president, you know, at the minute after he becomes president, the Republican attack media machine, Fox News, and all the other uh, associated news sources, the, uh, the great, what, was, what did uh, Clinton call it? The, the great right wing echo chamber, you know, <laughs> will begin to target Biden or whomever, and he'll have to fight through that. Yeah, I, I, since I, I live in Japan and I, I look at American media, well, actually started with the Iraq war and how badly that was mismanaged by the New York Times, even the, you know, the, the papers that you would think would do a better job. I've been a little bit disillusioned with the American media now. And of course I read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, but I, I'm, I'm cynical about that. I, I don't trust them. So, because even they, they were swayed by um, the trends at that time and, and were doing things that actually made things worse. Well, so in, in Japan, it? just briefly there, uh, there isn't much of a opposition media here. It's been kind of uh, pressured out of existence. There is a slightly liberal, liberal left-wing leaning newspaper called the Asahi newspaper, but during the Abe administration, um, they've been attacked several times. Again, not, not legally, but kind of indirectly, so it's somewhat silenced them. So we don't really have that, that play of uh, interaction of media. Generally, the media in Japan is supportive of the government and supportive of business. Well, you know, it goes down to one, one more point. We'll, uh, we're going to be out of time. But yeah, we're over time, Jay. But one, yeah. one more point is this, though, that, um, you know, to have uh, an effective leader, you have to have followers. Um, mm. And if nobody is going to follow somebody for a good reason or a bad reason, it right. doesn't work. The system doesn't work. And it's, it's all about the social compact. It's like we get into a deal uh, to embrace a given system, uh, a system of laws, a constitution, what have you, and some principles. Right. Um, and that means that we embrace leaders who are selected by that system. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think we are now in a place where we can see pretty clearly that the system, that people don't respect the system. The social compact for many people in this country, I don't know, I'll ask about Japan. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, for many people, um, it's not worth the powder. They no longer have confidence in it, and therefore they no longer have confidence in the leaders uh, that are selected, whether they be on one side of the aisle or the other. I mean, if the, if the social fabric is torn, it goes beyond one administration. And all I'm saying is I think there's real issues about whether you can repair Humpty um, after, after this administration. Is yeah. the same kind of thing happened in Japan? Um, no, not to that degree. Uh, there is recognition uh, that their government fails. I mean, there's many, many uh, cases 
uh, like mismanagement of the pension fund or every, periodically there's corruption that's exposed by the media. So the, the, I think the Japanese people recognize that uh, government is fallible, is corrupt in many instances. Uh, the leaders are not strong. Uh, they recognize that, but it, I don't think this culture, this society is at the point where there's a, a disbelief that the government will fail or that the government doesn't represent us or the government is not important. Um, probably over my years in Japan, the sense that the government is ineffective, that sense has grown, but it's nowhere near to the point that you're describing in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, was, Abe's numbers are going down and there's jockeying going on right now within the LDP to replace him. So he may be out maybe by the end of this year or early next year and a new leader will step in and probably the people initially will embrace that new leader and his numbers will be in the 60 to 70 percent range. The cycle will begin again until he proves to the people that somehow he's also not as effective as what they initially had hoped. <laughs> so uh, I would say that that breakdown in democracy, which is so clear in the United States, this, this should be a topic maybe, Jay, you explore with your other uh, groups potentially. Does, is democracy still effective in today's world? I mean, you can make a strong case looking at America that maybe it's no longer effective. Yeah. But here anyway, that, that sense of cynicism and that sense of uh, disconnectedness with the government uh, effectiveness or the government ability is, is not as strong. And that's part of Confucianism, kind of the, the social cultural history of Japan, as opposed to this uh, libertarianism or this, you know, this exploration sense that, you know, Americans were uh, people who came from another country and conquered it, you know, settled it. Noam Chomsky talks about this. Also, you know, genocide was an, an element of that. I don't want to get into the, the harsh politics of that. But anyway, that conquering sense of mentality and exploring mentality. Uh, is not something that the Japanese have historically, because according to Japanese history, they've been here forever, right? They've been here forever. <laughs> it was their country. There, there, of course, there were natives here, but that's kind of, you know, uh, put over on the side. <laughs> uh, Steve, I so enjoy our conversations. I look forward to our next one. And um, yeah. we, certainly we should track on um, how this is all changing, because it's so dynamic, changing from day to day. And I, and I feel yeah. sure that there'll be remarkable events in the interim which we will need to talk about. Yeah, it's it's a dynamic time that we're, li we're living in. And you know, most of the news is bad. I try and focus on the positive aspects that are coming out of this, the change that's now uh, increasing in Japan, in, within businesses, within universities. But yeah, overall, this, this is really tough. It's yeah. a tough period of time. So we all need to draw an inspiration from somewhere. I don't know, maybe the leaders that we're looking to might not provide that. Uh, maybe it has to come from within somehow. But anyway, yes. Jay, I'm, I'm waxing philosophically now. Valuable. Uh, Steve Zercher, a professor and dean at Kansai Gaidai University in Kobe. Thank you yep. so much for joining me and having this yep. discussion on looking to the East. Aloha.